Uh, very good afternoon, distinguished guests, uh, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to CSIS. Uh, we are uh, delighted to host uh, Pascal Lamy. As we know, he's the former general, uh, director general of WTO, and now he's the chair of France Pacific Territories PECC National Committee. And our topics, I think that will be very much interesting because, as I know, uh, I've heard uh, Pascal Ami spoke about this issue very passionately uh, in the past few years, including once at CSIS, if I remember that correctly. And now it's even become more important as we, uh, I think, across the globe, uh, sees the tendency to become more protectionist and uh, in some sense, in some areas, you know, some sense of nationalism uh, arise and so on and so forth. And the question of our uh, topic is then, uh, globalization, is globalization doomed? And uh, I don't know the answer. Uh, we will hear from Pascal Ami uh, whether he is optimistic or pessimistic about the answer, but uh, I think we in Indonesia is very much uh, interested uh, to hear from uh, Pascal Ami because uh, I noticed there are a number, many, uh, a number of uh, <coughs> government officials uh, from some ministries, including uh, our Ministry of Trade, and then uh, some uh, I noticed from foreign ministry, as uh, scholars as well, and uh, I think uh, it's uh, uh, delighted to see that you all come here at 2 p.m. Uh, on Monday uh, to hear this uh, topic that uh, I think it's an indication that we actually uh, would like to really uh, learn from uh, Pascal Ami uh, about this, uh, this theme. So uh, again, uh, I wish us a very good uh, discussion and thank you all for coming to CSIS. I return the microphone to the MC. Thank you, Dr. Fermonte, for a very warm greetings. Now, we are moving to the next session, the presentation by Mr. Pascal Ami. First, we invite our moderator, Professor Mari Pangestu, our senior fellow in Center for Strategic and International Studies, to the stage. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for coming, as Philip said, on a Monday uh, at 2 p.m. because usually Mondays are not never a good day, as we said, to have a seminar. But it's great to have a good uh, turnout, uh, and I'm hoping that you all came. Uh, I think not so. Uh, Pascal is everybody knows Pascal, but I think the topic itself is raising uh, a lot of questions for all of us. Yeah, and uh, I'm, I'm I'm not sure you're going to give us an answer, but at least uh, you can share with us your thoughts. Uh, it'd be great if if uh, people knew the answer to this very important question because we all know that this is really what we are all facing today. In the last, uh, especially since the global financial crisis, we have seen uh, the rise of so-called anti-globalization but with very different sources and with very different reasons in, in different countries. And we also know that uh, it is affecting uh, many of the multilateral institutions that had been sort of, in a way, taken for granted uh, would be with us. I mean, Bretton Woods celebrated its 75 years last year, wasn't it? Yeah, and, and we, are, we were all uh, being asked to question, you know, are the Bretton Woods uh, institutions still relevant? So uh, I can't think of a better person than Pascal uh, to share with us his thoughts uh, because he, as Phillips mentioned, he was the Director General for the WTO for two terms. And this is probably where I, I as the Minister of Trade at the time, had a lot of interactions uh, with Pascal and uh, also had it, I guess my first interaction with you as trade minister was when you were European Trade Commissioner. Yeah, so uh, we've we've gone through a lot together, and maybe our war scars shows or not shows, I don't know. Uh, but you know, we have gone through thick and thin uh, in the trade policy world, and so uh, I think this is maybe your third or fourth time that you have come 
to speak at CSIS as well as in other fora in Indonesia uh, to inform us on what's happening uh, in the world, especially regarding trade issues. But I think your, issue, your interests now span more than just trade, just because uh, now we can no longer separate trade from all the many other international issues that tend to become uh, interlinked. Uh, and uh, he is now, uh, we, people will ask this question, Pascal, why is, why is a Frenchman uh, being um, a member of PECC, right? <laughs> because the Pacific Economic Cooperation Council is basically uh, Asia Pacific countries, and CSIS is also the uh, National Committee, the Secretariat. Uh, but because of the French Polynesia, is that, is that right? Did I get that right? French Pol Polynesia. Polynesia is a part of the Pacific, uh, and that's why we, we do have a French National Committee, which is part of the French Polynesia, but it's to our benefit, actually, to have uh, a, a link, perhaps, if you like, uh, to Europe and, and uh, in, for, for the Asia Pacific. And I'm not going to re read all of his uh, bio. He comes from a very distinguished background and career. I will just tell he you that he is the president of the Paris Peace Forum. He is a marathoner. He runs marathon almost every day, I think, <laughs> wherever he is. Uh, and he's also a concert pianist. Am I right? Right. Okay. <laughs> and you are, uh, I think you have an orchestra that you, you, you take care of in, in, in France. Am I right? Yeah. So he's a man of many talents, not just the, the Pascal Lamy, the trade expert that we know. So uh, without further ado, let me uh, invite Pascal to share with us uh, hopefully some answers or some insights to this uh, big question about globalization that we're all facing. Pascal? Well, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Let me first uh, thank uh, once more uh, CSIS for this uh, invitation. As uh, was just said, on a topic which uh, we've been uh, discussing for some time, and I bet we will still be discussing for some time, uh, which is uh, this uh, question of uh, what's the course of globalization, this time under this a bit more dramatic title, uh, is globalization due? Uh, the starting point I think uh, we all agree on, which is that uh, globalization uh, has been uh, the main uh, transformation of the world uh, for now uh, several decades. And what I call globalization uh, for the purpose of this discussion uh, is a face among past and future uh, phases, periods of uh, capitalism, a phase where uh, an expansion of market capitalism uh, results in uh, an intensification of international exchange, uh, whether uh, trade, goods, services, uh, capital flows, people. This is roughly what I uh, mean by globalization. And I think it's uh, quite obvious that uh, for a rather long time, starting probably in the 80s, the view had uh, uh, prevailed that this new reality uh, we were uh, living into would be a sort of new normal, that the future of the world would be about a globalized world, whatever shape uh, this globalization uh, would uh, take. Only a very few people thought otherwise. Uh, there were, of course, a few dissenting opinions, but the vast majority converged uh, with this vision. Uh, this clearly has changed recently. Uh, as uh, Marie uh, Pangetsu just said, the 
inflection point uh, probably uh, was the global financial crisis. Uh, and from uh, then on, it seems that globalization has been uh, less uh, popular, uh, more questioned in various uh, places on this planet, uh, to the point that some, not that many, but some, uh, now hold the view that we've entered into a new period uh, with a sort of uh, globalization going in reverse, sort of de-globalization. Uh, some like it, others uh, not. Uh, some see more globalization, be it on a different pattern as the solution to a number of problems we have, uh, and others uh, see uh, it as uh, the way to go. Uh, some see de deglobalization as a threat, and others see deglobalization uh, as a, a possibility. So, the purpose of this uh, remarks is to try and shed some light about this question, uh, and I will do that in uh, roughly three steps. One, uh, to start with, is looking at the main factors which have been uh, shaping uh, globalization in uh, recent decades. Uh, second step is uh, looking at uh, why this change of mood uh, has happened. And the third one uh, is about whether or not we are uh, heading uh, to uh, something different than globalization, uh, which will be my own answer uh, to the question that uh, occupies us today. Starting with why we've had globalization, uh, which, as I already said, succeeded previous phases of globalization and will probably be uh, in whatever time in the future followed by other waves of globalization, uh, I think this is the result of two main shaping factors. Uh, one is uh, technology and the other one is uh, ideology. Uh, technology, because the wave of globalization we've been going through, like previous wages, waves of globalization, uh, resulted from a leap in uh, the technology of transportation systems. Now, it started many centuries ago when uh, ships learned how to sail properly uh, even if the wind was not a rear wind. Uh, it then moved to uh, steam and then to electricity and then to aviation and then of course to uh, internet. And all these phases, successive phases, have resulted in something uh, which is extremely important uh, for uh, trade and connecting production systems of goods and services, uh, which is crushing each time by a major factor, the cost of distance. For a very long time, what had limited theoretical benefits of international division of labor, uh, which is about localizing production systems, whether goods or services, to the place where it is the most efficient. Uh, the biggest obstacle to this international division of labor for a long time was distance, geographical distance, and the cost of this distance. It can easily be understood that as technology of transportation systems moved forward, each time the cost of distance shrunk to the point where 
we are heading to, which is probably sort of zero, at least for the raw material of the economy in the times to come, uh, which is data. We know that the cost of transport of data is not exactly, but quasi zero. And this will, is, and will remain a main shaping factor of globalization. This will not go back. And I'll come back, of course, to uh, the future of globalization. But insofar as it has been driven by science, technology, innovation, and that we know that science, technology, innovation do not move back, then this huge engine uh, will uh, remain as it is. Of course, of course, not identical. Huh? If uh, relative prices of, let's say, carbon, for instance, change, if the implicit or explicit price of carbon moves from 20 euros a ton to 100 euro a ton or even 150 euro a ton, globalization flows will adjust, they will change, they will be different, but it still will be a globalization system or a globalized system. It will change as it has always changed with movements in relative prices. So that's the first shaping factor. The second one is uh, ideology. And this one is probably less constant than the previous one. We know that in human history, uh, ideology can move uh, forward or backward. We know, and we've had experiences in human history uh, where uh, we now all agree that at some stage, humans took decisions that moved humanity backwards instead of moving it forward. And this second shaping factor, uh, which is ideology, uh, resulted during the big times of globalization uh, in, a, in a consensus according to which uh, opening of international exchange was the right way to go. This was a sort of converging uh, views, uh, which was shared by many on this planet. And the model behind this being a relatively simple uh, Ricardo Schumpeterian model. Ricardo, uh, who made clear that uh, the game of comparative advantage following uh, Adam Smith is the right one. If I do something better than you do, and you do something better than I do, then we have a logical, rational interest to exchange. I will benefit from your efficiencies, and you will benefit from my efficiencies, and the sum of this is a higher overall level of efficiency, so the win-win theory uh, behind uh, international exchange. Of course, it works because of what Schumpeter explained. It works because your domestic producers uh, will be confronted with a higher level of competition from my domestic producers, and then they will have to change, adapt, adapt, and they will become more efficient, and the other way around, so that you cannot, in a way, separate Ricardo from Schumpeter. Uh, it, it works because it reshovels competition and allocation of production factors, and this is why it is efficient, but it is also why it is painful, because producers have to adjust to a new competitive environment, and they have to change. And change is something uh, which is uh, very often painful, and notably for the part of the uh, populations uh, who have the hardest time to change, which are usually the weakest one and not the strongest one. I mean, the strongest ones usually are better at uh, capturing occasions, uh, they have the necessary vision, agility, intelligence, whereas others have a harder time to adjust. So this ideology, according to which uh, reducing obstacle to trade 
and multi-localizing and spanning the world with these global supply chains, uh, which we've had, and, and notably, if not only, but notably here in Asia, uh, and which has resulted in huge efficiencies, also has resulted in some cases in uh, social and economic uh, hardship. Which is uh, probably, and I'm come back to my, I'm coming to my second point, which is probably one of the few reasons why this rosy uh, picture, according to which globalization was the way to, uh, to go, as long as it was a win-win situation and domestic systems adjusted to offsetting, managing, cautioning the sort of social hardship, this is one of the reasons why it has changed. And I don't think uh, these change, which I will briefly uh, describe now, I don't think this change changes the fact that globalization overall has worked. It has worked. When you look at the numbers, it has worked. Uh, the positive effects of globalization uh, have happened. I mean, globalization, according to Ricardo and Schumpeter, has delivered uh, in making much more winners than losers. That's what our numbers say. Just look at the amount of people on this planet who've been uh, lifted out of poverty. Of course, with some simultaneous uh, consequences on the increase of uh, inequality. And I think this is the first reason why there is now, in some places, a different view on globalization. Uh, which is that this winner-loser equation, which was a clear winner for a long time, has become less of a clear winner. Uh, where does this come from? I think it doesn't come from the fact that the number of winners remains much larger than the number of losers. I think it stems from the fact that the one that lose, and some lose, lose more than they used to. In many ways, I mean, the efficiency, the pressure, some would say the violence of globalization has increased because it's, got, it's becoming more and more efficient and technology and ideology have moved in this direction. But the capacity of losers to adjust has not followed the same direction. Their capacity to adjust has been weakened, and this stems mostly, and this is where we come to the timing of this change, this comes mostly uh, from the uh, 08 crisis. Uh, the 08 crisis, at least in the Western world, was the moment where, for a number of reasons, uh, social safety nets had to shrink, in most cases, not all, not my country, for instance, but it's a bit uh, exceptional and specific. But it's true that at the time of the economic crisis, as a follow-up of this financial, economic, social crisis, uh, part of the Western population uh, was hit more than could have been expected, hence resulting in uh, frustrations, is mean content, and in questioning of this uh, model. So the first reason of this change of mood is uh, that Western system, at least, have not been as good as they had been previously in addressing the inevitable social hardship consequences of moving to a more globalized world. So these sort of social justice problem, which was there for a long time, but which the, the problem of which increased uh, on the occasion of uh, dealing with the financial and economic crisis, I think is the first element why it has changed, plus, of course, 
a sort of ideological doubt that global capitalism was the way to go, that there was no other solution. Uh, the sort of leg the ideological legitimacy of global capitalism was hit by the size and the violence of the um, 08 uh, crisis. So social justice being probably one of the reasons why uh, the benefits of globalization as a system uh, have uh, started being questioned. A second one uh, is uh, the well-known uh, issue of uh, environment, uh, which was not there uh, 20, uh, 20 or 30 years ago. I mean, it was there somehow because there were a few people in the Club of Rome who had started uh, questioning uh, whether you know, constant economic uh, growth and progress uh, would not at some stage uh, hit a wall in uh, limitation of natural resources. But it's obvious that at least for one or two decades, this has become a major problem and it will, in my view, uh, become even, even more of a major problem in the years to come. So there is a basic questioning of whether this globalized system, which results in the intensification of trade, whether this global system is or not environment friendly. And if you go down in the street and you ask people whether uh, the intensification of international exchange is or not environment friendly, most of the people got reaction will be it is not environment friendly. And it's a very complex issue. And the Institut Jacques Delors, with whom I keep uh, working quite a lot, is publishing a series of a brief on this, which you can find on the website, which is about whether, for instance, uh, trade and environment can go hand in hand. And there was a, a new piece that was published uh, last week about this that I co-authored uh, with a lady that runs the Institut Jacques Delors in, uh, in Brussels. This question is now more and more openly questioning the benefits of globalization. It's, again, a complex question, and there are many reasons uh, to have uh, views on both sides, but this is certainly one of the elements of this change of mood. The third uh, element which uh, has led to some questioning of this uh, model is that you can hardly separate the recent wave of globalization, let's say for the three or four last decades, you can hardly separate it from China. One of the major changes of globalization is not the cause of globalization in my view, but it's one of the major changes has been the re-eruption of China uh, into the world uh, economy. Not that China had not been there uh, some centuries ago, but it had taken the decision for some time uh, to uh, stop uh, increasing its uh, capacity to breathe economically and culturally with the rest of the world until Deng Xiaoping decided to move back uh, at, the end of the, uh, at the end of the 70s. And this, of course, the incredibly rapid rise of China, uh, and there's zero precedent in human history, nor in contemporary history of a country uh, succeeding during so many years to grow its economy and its country so rapidly. Uh, this, of course, is a major change. And it's a major change which has big geopolitical consequences, not least because of uh, questioning uh, by definition, uh, the supremacy of the previous hegemon, uh, which was the United States of America. So in many ways, uh, this growing geopolitical rivalry uh, between uh, China and US is the major, if not the only, the major uh, element that shakes this 
previously reasonably convergent uh, level of globalization. And we've seen that in uh, the recent uh, evolution of US uh, strategic thinking vis-a-vis uh, -vis China. I'll come back to Trump in a moment, but this is not Trump. Huh? The notion in Washington that China used to be a country that needed to be uh, contained to a new stance that China is a country that needs to be confronted, this is something, Trump or no Trump, which has happened in Washington for recent years. We now are in a situation where this uh, rivalry uh, has taken a much more confrontational stance, and whether we like it or not, this is what's happening at the moment. And of course, it has a big impact on globalization because it may and probably already has led these two big elephants of the world and of the world economy uh, to think that they become too dependent on one another. They become too globalized. And the way to go in order to address this problem, which results in the feeling both in Washington and in Beijing that they become too vulnerable to each other because they become too dependent on each other. And this is exactly the view on the high tech area in the digital world, in chips, uh, more or less uh, clever and intelligent ships, this leads both sides to believe that they have to decouple what had been previously coupled by globalization. And this development, which by the way is a direct consequence of technological developments, which I ranked previously in the previous big engines of globalization, one of the paradoxes is that the big development in science that led to digitalization also lead to cyber fragilities. And it is because of these cyber fragilities that the view raises on both sides uh, that now uh, this has to be addressed in reducing vulnerability. Now, of course, then it de very much depends on how you do it. And then comes Trump, who has a way to behave and to do things which is uh, totally uh, disruptive uh, as compared to the sort of normal management of international relations, and I'll come back to that in a minute. But this uh, fundamental element is here to stay. Uh, I mean, among the other causes of why the mood uh, towards globalization has changed. They may be more or less constant. They can change in size, dimension. Whether uh, modern capitalism can adjust better social injustice is an open question. Some would believe it can, others it can't, but depending on views, uh, whether the expansion of international trade and international it bring benefits or costs to the environment depends. Let's assume you have a proper carbon price that properly internalizes in production systems the externalities on climate of production systems, then modern capitalism will adjust. If tomorrow we decide we have 100 euros a ton for carbon, market capitalism will do the trick. I mean, we haven't done that. I'm not sure we can do it, <laughs> unfortunately. But it could happen. Whereas this US-China rivalry, this new sort of tension is there to stay. This one we have to know, we'll have to live with for the next 20, 30, or 40 years. 
And there was, a, as many of you know, a Greek uh, historian uh, who was called uh, Thucydides and who wrote a theory according to which no big reshuffling of power uh, among established power uh, would take place without serious conflicts and war consequences. I don't think for a variety of reasons we are going there, but this is certainly uh, something that we have to keep in mind and which largely explains this change of mood from uh, Kissinger containment, from uh, Bob Zolik's uh, uh, China as a reasonable stakeholder theory to something which is much more China has to be pushed back. Now, this uh, leads me to the final uh, question uh, which is under these circumstances which are changing with this different mood which appears in the various uh, places of this planet and it's not just in the Western world. No, you have uh, people in the streets in uh, many countries uh, in this uh, world. Uh, and the question is, is deglobalization uh, the next pattern? Is it uh, the way to go? Uh, my own view, for what it's worth, uh, is uh, that it is not the way to go. And I, of course, qualify this answer. Uh, but it's not the way to go for one main reason, uh, which I believe uh, is that given the extremely high degree of interdependence we've reached with this several decades of uh, globalization, uh, deglobalization would be too costly to happen. And I probably wouldn't have answered the same, uh, same question in the same way 20 or 30 years ago. But in the meantime, we've gotten so closely interdependent through uh, the interdependence of our production systems. Again, goods, services, capital, people, in many areas that the infrastructures of globalization, the economic infrastructures, will probably, will probably uh, remain uh, very interconnected and that getting out of that would be uh, both inefficient and painful. So in many ways, I mean, globalization is efficient and painful, and depending on how you address the pain, people's view on globalization may differ, but what I'm pretty sure is that deglobalization is both inefficient and painful, which is probably, probably why the infrastructures will resist existing temptations uh, to question it or uh, sort of de-init it as, uh, as we've had uh, a very good example in Europe with Brexit. Uh, for us Europeans and for you non-Europeans, watching uh, this uh, mini lab of deglobalization which Brexit is about, uh, and that's what it is, there is a sort of higher level of globalization within the European Union between EU members and what, what UK is trying to do is, uh, is to deglobalize from the EU globalization. And what numbers tell us and what the facts tell us is that they have a hard time finding how to do it without, without having to face the big cost which it entails in economic terms. We have another example of an attempt to deglobalize, uh, which so far has uh, miserably failed, uh, which is a Trump uh, trade policy. Uh, after all, his view is that US have become too globalized and that they have to deglobalize and that deglobalizing will be good for the US. Plus, of course, the fact that simultaneously you hit uh, China which you have to do in order to preserve U.S. interests in the future. Now, this other example 
of an attempt to deglobalize has so far led to a lot of economic damage for everybody and quasi zero, if not zero, positive effects. What he is after, which is making the US economy stronger, has not worked trade wise. Of course, given the huge fiscal reform he's done, he's put a lot of coal in the, uh, in the machine of the US uh, economy, of course, and it's booming at a cost of a much higher level of uh, indebtedness. But if you look at his attempt to reduce US trade deficit, there's nothing like a reduction of the US trade deficit. If anything, <laughs> there's an increase of US trade deficit, as, by the way, could have been expected, because when you inflate an economy which is near uh, production potential, uh, then you increase imports to satisfy uh, the consumption request. Uh, which you've inflated into the system. So this is another short-term example of why uh, deglobalization understood in this sense does not work, and I'm leaving aside the negative impact on my view on China, which is the fact that handling China the way he does it has a result which is making the Chinese part of the Politburo, uh, who is the most conservative, the most nationalistic, the most communist, the most opposed to internationalization, and there was always a minority. Even since Deng Xiaoping, if you look at the Chinese leadership, there always was a small minority during all these years said, oh, oh, be careful, trusting these long noses is not the way to go, you're becoming too dependent on them, now, it was a small minority for a long time. The impact of Trump behaving the way he does is that this is probably becoming a majority within the Politburo, following, by the way, Xi Jinping's view, which, as we know, is quite different from uh, his uh, predecessors. So I don't think this is the way to go. So far, deglobalization, where it has been tried, and Brexit and Trump, are probably both products of mismanaged globalization. Trump would not have been elected president of the US if the US social system had probably coped with the consequences of the US crisis on part of the US working population. I don't think Brexit would have happened in the in UK if the UK government had not in embarked on a very severe austerity policy after the 08 crisis. So Brexit and Trump, who are the two examples of so far unsuccessful deglobalization, are also the products of a relatively unsuccessful globalization, at least uh, on, the, on, the, on the social side. So if that's not the way to go, which I think so far numbers and facts show, confirming that deglobalization uh, is both uh, inefficient and painful. What's the way to go, given that we have this problem of, of change, of mood, at least a legitimacy uh, in, uh, in globalization? Of course, there is a short-term issue there, which is uh, what you do with WTO and with the international rules-based trading system, which is under attack from Washington. Now, whether it's under attack from Washington because Washington wants to get rid of the system and reshape the whole world economy into a series of bilateral transactional deals, you know, back to some sort of middle age, where you manage trade and I buy carrots and you buy sheep and, you know, I will only buy more of your sheep if you buy more of my carrots and how much, and this is something we can discuss, which is roughly the, the view Trump has of what trade is about, to be frank. Uh, the guy is a, certainly a political genius, whether good or bad is a matter of appreciation, but in economic terms, he's certainly not a genius, at least on trade. 
at least what I understand from what he understands on trade. Uh, but of course, this is a big challenge, and they, the big challenge needs to be uh, properly uh, addressed, and there are ways to do that. I think uh, in making the WTO system uh, resilient, we might discuss that a bit uh, further with uh, Marie, who is uh, as much as an expert as I am on this, uh, but it's a good example of there probably is a way to go to resist and confront this attack uh, in creating the necessary counter coalition that would help uh, resisting uh, this uh, US uh, trade offensive. This will not change the fact that, for instance, interna international division of labor has become more socially painful. This needs to be addressed. And this is not a global issue. Uh, this is a question of how you organize your domestic systems in order to uh, better address this winner-loser equation in providing more benefits to the losers than has been the case so far. And this is mostly to do uh, with social uh, systems, with education, with uh, uh, regional policies, with uh, retraining, with empowering people, with uh, a better ability to cope with te technological change and so on. We know what should be done to flexibilize uh, labor markets. We know uh, what should be done in making uh, social welfare systems more efficient. Uh, the problem being that, uh, at least in the Western world, uh, most people know how to do it, uh, but they don't know how to be re-elected if they do it. which is a constraint on how to move forward. Making trade more environmental friendly is, a, in my view, a perfectly soluble equation. You can even make the case that it's because of international division of labor that spreading proper uh, technological change in the way you produce energy or spreading better uh, waste management systems or better spreading uh, circular economy will be done better in an open world than in a closed world. And this notion that often is there in green minds that uh, producing everything local is the solution, uh, frankly speaking, does not make sense. I mean, I'm not saying it never makes sense. It sometimes makes sense, but it sometimes doesn't make sense. Because if what matters is how much natural resources you consume in order to produce something, there are places where they are more abundant than others. And this stems from the benefits of the game of comparative advantages. So again, there is probably a way to make globalization more social friendly. There's probably a way to make globalization more environment friendly. And there's probably a way to address uh, a number of holes in the racket of global governance, which is also one of the reasons why the impression has spread in uh, some quarters that there is this big deficit between the challenges of globalization on the one side and the global governance capacity to address them, uh, this famous global governance deficit, uh, which is an issue we've been uh, dealing with and working with uh, for a long time. Uh, I think it's pretty obvious that the international system we have inherited from the Westphalian uh, period, uh, when at the end of the Westphalian uh, peace discussion in 1648, roughly people decided that international relations would be in the hands of nation states. We would not fight for religious reasons. We would fight for good old national uh, state-related uh, tensions. This system has its limits. And if you look at, for instance, environment, uh, it's obvious that it has taken far too long a time to be able to address this problem collectively, that there's no way it makes any sense to address it individually 
at least at the level of a nation state. And yet, we are lagging behind what we all know should have been done and necessitate that we do more in the future than if we had taken uh, the problem uh, previously. I was in the Antarctica uh, uh, to try and uh, move uh, marine protected around the Antarctica at the beginning of this year and with the Chilean president, who at the time didn't have the problems he had, had in between. And he, he, made, he made a very, very convincing pitch about environment, saying, you know, we are uh, the first generation to understand the problem we are facing, and we are the last generation that can address it, which is a bit of a stressing uh, position, which I think which is where we are. So it's pretty obvious that if one takes these examples, but other could be taken, and we might discuss that uh, later on, like uh, the data regimes for the digital era, and we know that we are moving to a situation where there will be uh, three different kingdoms in the area of data, US, EU, China, uh, US because it's uh, merchandise you can buy and sell, uh, China because the party and the state uh, have to exceed all data all the time, Europe because of this privacy issue, which your, you own your data, and if you don't want to share your data, you don't have to share your data. And these three systems are profoundly different in philosophical and cultural premises. How, if that is true, do you address the problem of making sure the world remains interconnected and that we can still benefit from a huge connection among these zillions of data which we will need? Uh, to trade and uh, make sure they work for uh, artificial intelligence or Internet of Things, how do you organize a proper coexistence is a big global issue which so far we haven't uh, properly addressed. And this uh, takes me to uh, my job, <laughs> one of my uh, many caps in, uh, in uh, today's activities, which is this uh, Paris Peace Forum, uh, which uh, Marie mentioned, uh, which is a new attempt to address this global governance deficit uh, in a way that is very different from the previous way. The previous way was, you know, we remain on a system that results from the interaction of 200 different nation states. When they agree, we get something done. When they don't agree, we don't get things done. Now, that's the starting point. The realization being that there are lots of things we need to do, but which nation states are unable to agree on. And then the answer is, let's have other than nation states agreeing on this. Let's build coalitions purpose-based coalitions, project-based coalitions, solution-based coalitions between civil society organizations, businesses, big cities, big academic institutions who now have an ambition of tackling global problems. So instead of doing this top-down through diplomatic systems, and I have nothing against diplomats, and we have a very good uh, French ambassador in this room, so I love diplomats, uh, the problem being that, again, uh, it's not to get rid of them. It's just to try and do what they haven't succeeded in doing and what nation states have not succeeded in doing in getting things done. We've had uh, two editions of the Paris Peace Forum. It's a rather promising avenue because the level of energy you can tap in uh, constituencies like young people, like young businesses, like startups, like cities, and look at how the C40, for instance, has seriously impacted climate negotiations. So this is one of the ways to go, hopefully helping to bridge and fill uh, this uh, global governance deficit, which is one of the limitations of how we can properly and better harness globalization. And that leads me to my conclusion, trying to answer this uh, question. 
Uh, a, I don't think globalization is doomed. B, I believe we have serious problems with the present, past, and somehow present uh, course of globalization. Three, I still believe uh, is the way to go, provided uh, we can harness it properly, which we probably collectively have not been doing properly, at least for 10 or 15 years. Uh, so globalization, in my view, is not doomed, provided, provided uh, we can redirect it, re-harness it uh, into uh, a system uh, that becomes uh, more economically sustainable, less crisis-prone, more socially sustainable, with as much reduction of poverty but less reduction, more reduction of inequalities, and for sure, more uh, environmentally friendly. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, uh, Pascal, for your very, uh, very, very insightful comments and I guess trying to answer the question. Uh, perhaps for those who, don't, who are not too familiar with the Paris Peace Forum, from what I understand, it's your model of plurilateral governance, is that right? So it's, it's beyond governments, it's, uh, you might want to just explain what's the intention. Well, that's, that's right. Uh, I mean, the creation of the Paris Peace Forum stems from a father and a mother. Uh, no, I'm not, I'm not saying who is the father and who is the mother. I just, I just mean that we needed two. <laughs> One was the French president, who last year had to celebrate the anniversary of the 100th anniversary of the armistice of the First World War. France had to do that. No, it had been a major uh, issue for Europe and for France. There was the necessity to salute the incredible number of people who died at the time for what well, now, a century after, looks like rather mediocre reasons, huh? which is what catastrophes are. Right? It's with a huge and bad uh, result stems from unpredictable circumstances. So there was a lot of memory and there was a lot of necessity to remember, and rightly so, and you know, he conveyed uh, half of the heads of state and government of this planet uh, because so many of them, their countries had been involved in this uh, First World War. But if you were that this needed to be done, and there was a necessity to do that, not least to remember, but simultaneously we had to look forward. We also had to rethink about peace. We also had to relook at how to make this world less tension, less confrontational, and relook at, at a time where multilateralism was under severe attack, mostly, if not only, uh, by uh, new US president, his view was that we had to relook at that. And that, that was an occasion to do that. And then he looked at my idea, which had, had been a, you yeah. know, right to mention this, had been to try and move the global governance system from multilateralism to polylateralism. And multi being among sovereign member states, poly being among other than members, different stakeholders. And this is the combination of these uh, two ideas which gave rise to the Paris Peace Forum, which is a process, which is symbolized by an event which takes place every year at the time of the celebration of the armistice, which is November. Uh, it's a process where we collect roughly a thousand uh, projects, 
that people submit with a view that this is a good idea or a good project or a good precedent that can be scaled up at global level in order to address a specific problem. So it's people who propose solutions which they believe are proper ways to address a number of holes in the racket of global governance. Now, whether it's on technology, on social inclusion, on culture, on uh, women's rights, on uh, environment, we have five or six different clusters. So we fish for roughly a thousand of projects. Within this thousand, we select a hundred of them through a proper vetting selection process. And this hundred is convened, invited, during two days in Paris in November. And they have, you have a huge place, a huge hall in Paris La Villette, which is a fantastic uh, sort of space. And these hundred projects are displayed, showcased, argued by the people who are supporting the project. So it's a sort of big, fair exhibition of projects. Huh? Uh, with, with the people who believe you know, they're after something important and that really needs to fly. Whereas for the moment they haven't gotten the sort of media attention, the political support, the financial capacity to move their idea forward. And then 10 of them among these 100 win the right to be followed up the next year into what we call a scale-up system, which is basically an incubator. Uh, now, we don't run the project ourselves, we don't buy the project, we don't own the projects, but we help them getting for some financial, for some political, for some media support. I was mentioning this uh, project uh, of uh, surrounding the Antarctica with marine protected areas, for instance, which is a big issue because, as you know, the ice is melting and this is softening the waters and this seriously uh, depletes the krill resources and these krill resources are a big thing in the upstream of the whole food chain in oceans, both on shore and in water. And this, I mean, surrounding the Antarctica with marine protected areas is just about convincing Mr. Xi Jinping and Mr. Putin that they should accept what others have accepted, which is stop fishing krill around the Antarctica. Now, this is not something that necessitates money. It does necessitate a bit of media visibility so that they feel responsible for, and it then necessitates a number of world leaders to knock on the door of Mr. Putin or Mr. Xi Jinping and say, uh, why don't you do that? So it's, it's an example of something that the normal process of governance of conservation in Antarctica will not provide. Uh, the sort of 60 people around the table can, cannot agree on that. They all have good reasons, legal, economic, to do that. We have to do something special. We had another uh, project that was, was primed that last week, which was about a number of multinationals agreeing between themselves to adopt a new taxonomy to measure how much they are moving in the direction of the SDGs. Again, not a question of money. These people have resources, at least about putting two or three, four million dollars. They have no problem doing that. But it's a question of finding the right table and the right visibility and connecting uh, statistical systems with the World Bank, with the IMF, with the OECD, and then cooking a new soup, which of course can make a big difference because if 40 big multinationals decide they have the same taxonomy in order to benchmark the way they move to SDGs, this is a big contribution to moving in the direction of SDGs. Uh, there was another project which was about Kenyan women who had invented a specific methodology to repair women who are victims of violence in conflict zones. This necessitated a bit of money, but 
No, their view was that if the Paris Peace Forum could help them helping the Rohingyas who had the same problem as Kenyan women have had in Kenya some years ago, that would be a great thing to do. And that would help moving on the global issue. So it's, it's a very diverse thing. There are more ambitious coalitions like uh, on cybersecurity or on freedom and information on social networks which are cooking, which may join. So that's what the Paris Peace Forum is about. Sorry, it takes a bit of time. But you know, these new things are attempts. It's, uh, so, so far, it's, it's working. And I think it deserves to be working better. But of course, it's new. Uh, it's a totally new attempt, new approach, with all the problems you find when you start something new. Thank you. Thank you, Pascal. I'd like to now open the, the floor for any questions or discussion. OK, by you and gentlemen in front, and then somebody at the back there. So uh, by you, please uh, introduce yourself and where you're from. Uh, thank you, Bumari. Uh, Pascal, very nice to meet you again. Uh, I'm Bayou from Bogor Agriculture University. Uh, the question about is globalization doom is exactly as you mentioned in the beginning of your very and excellent uh, lectures, is the definition of that globalization, which is trade, investment, uh, maybe also the mobilization of people. And that faced many problems and create also, you mentioned some, uh, I don't know, backlash or problems. But now there are also new definition, which is exactly, you also mentioned that in the end of the just uh, answering Bumari question about your project with the uh, 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 Paris Peace Forum. The globalization of concern on the environment the globalization of concern about basically SDGs. Uh, so 198 countries agrees on SDGs and that becoming new language in globalizations. Uh, my you know, reflection to, to your comment is, is it now we come to the second phase of globalization, which is not only for trade, investment, and others, but more on the, the mission, the global mission, the global objective. And uh, because that SDG, we cannot achieve it uh, alone. Nobody can achieve it alone. It has to be done together. It need to be done in the globalized manner. So if that, is that the, the way to see uh, globalization? Thank you. Can I collect three questions? Please. Sini, sini ada. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. My name is Rio. Uh, I just recently graduated, so I'm currently unemployed. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, thank you for the lecture. It was very insightful and kind of. Uh, overwhelming. So uh, I'm glad you uh, I'm glad you mentioned about the Brexit and Trump's uh, 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 trying to escape from globalization. I'm going to steal a line from uh, the Anis Varoufakis here. Uh, there's a line from the song Hotel California by Eagles that you can you can check out every time you anytime you like, but you can never leave. I think that is the point of is globalization is doomed. You can try to escape from globalization, but what to where? Yeah, there's a question. Then globalization started with trade, and I don't think it will end anytime soon when trading is becomes even more and more advanced. You are from, uh, uh, I, I think you, you already have a quite experience in being a general of WTO, so uh, I don't think globalization is too much. And then, comes to the existence of diaspora. If any country, for uh, in a hypothetical, hypothetical case, successfully deglobalize themselves, if they still have 
a diaspora in other place, they still have a connection. So that, that's why uh, I'm not really uh, assured, uh, assured to say globalization is doomed. However, you mentioned about the problems of globalization that is competition in trade, in manufacturing, and etc. Et now, the, uh, it's making me intrigued. Why are we fo focusing on competition but not cooperation? Because, you know, even, even though we, uh, we still all of the globalization, globalization is off, we still can have a, what is called, trade of chain trade, uh, trade of supply and demand, trade of supplies. I can't forget uh, the term. That was back when I was studying. So yeah, that's my quest, uh, question. Why are we focusing on competition during the globalization instead of cooperation? Thank you. Thank you. Good question from the millennial generation. I think there was a question there, yes. Good afternoon. My name is Givari. I'm from Friends and Partners. Uh, my question is regarding the globalization to Mr. Pascal Lamy. Do you think, despite the call for cooperation between states, there are some states which have stronger says over the other's decisions? I'm asking this because I'm reading the case of WTO's appellate body, where the, the appellate body is rumored to be almost be stopped because US is not appointing new judges in this early December. What's your view on that? What will happen to WTO and in specific and in general? What do you think about some states which have stronger says over others in the face of call for the new cooperation between states? Thank you. Okay, maybe I'll take one more over there. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Hidayat. I am from Central Bank of Indonesia. I have a question uh, regarding with your suggestion about the globalization will have the new phase or new adjustment more uh, social, uh, social be, uh, development or sustainable development. In, in my view, what we understand from the world today, when you look at the Chile example, unrest in Chile, and what happened in, in uh, another country, is the populist become more bigger and bigger. And what, what populist issues uh, say, it's more nationalist rather than globalist. We should thinking about what the national interest first, and then we thinking after that the global. In this case, in this view, it's not the new actually, but it is based on the experience. The, maybe the, you, you say like the lost experience that they faced with the globalization when they face in the globalization, and then they have the problem like inequality more bigger and bigger, especially in the Western world. So rather than we have the optimistic that you see, but I maybe see the different side. It's like we are in the pessimistic side when we look at the tendency, the politically in the uh, region is the more populist, more thinking about national. So what we what we can do because the populist is not based on the elite in the country. It's based on the population in the country. So the population seems think that the benefit of the globalization. It's uh, more or less uh, in terms of the uh, time range. So, uh, thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Uh, okay, that's okay. Uh, there'll first be another round. Back to the four major questions. I mean, on, on the first one, I very much agree that adopting this SDGs was a step forward in global governance in the traditional sense of the world, which is that they were adopted by the UN General Assembly. Uh, the reality being that many of these SDGs were crafted by other than diplomats. Uh, many of the ingredients in this big soup came from civil society, mm -hmm. came from social movements, came from corporate interest and contribution during the time it took to get there. Uh, so 
it is a major transformation of the international agenda. But the upstream was not Westphalian, and the downstream cannot be Westphalian. Uh, if we only rely on traditional international cooperation, we know we will not get there. And by the way, if you measure where we are in 2020 to the road to 2030, the general conclusion is that we are nowhere near where we should be in order to get there. And environment is not the only one. It's, it's the most obvious and probably the most existential one. Well, the world, the planet can live with too many poor. It's not nice to be poor, <laughs> and it's very unfair, but that will not change the fact that we will survive. Whereas if we don't address properly a number of uh, environment-related issues like climate, like biodiversity, it's just a question of mere survival. So my point is not that the SDGs are not a major progress. It is one, and I, I was less closely associated to this generation than I was to the previous one with the MDGs, which, by the way, were the real start of looking at a holistic uh, concept of the international agenda. And the SDGs are an improvement on the MDGs. So again, certainly a major step forward, but, but it doesn't change the necessity to move forward by other ways than just traditional international cooperation and involve uh, coalitions which are more efficient than other things. And you know, Marie will remember what we did at the time of the, uh, of the Oxford Martin Report, uh, when at the time, that was in the, uh, in the 20, 2012, 2013, uh, I was tasked with producing one of these many more reports about uh, challenges for the future and what new generation should be about. And we asked the Oxford Martin School teams to diagnose what had worked for the last 20 years in the international system and what had not worked. And the basic conclusion that what had worked had been done by other than traditional diplomatic systems, like HIV AIDS, for instance, which was, I mean, we're not there yet, but it is an example where faced with a huge global challenge, we reacted reasonably OK. But we only started reacting reasonably OK when the thing was taken out of the hands of governments and the WHO and even UNAIDS and where social activists engaged. And the pharma industry had this big fight about whether tiered pricing was the way to go or not. Some saying, no, never. Others saying, there's no other way. It was a big debate, and then at the end of the day, you have the global, uh, the global fund. And if you compare the global fund uh, board to the UN security board, I mean, you are in a totally different century. Uh, who sits about the global fund board is some pharma industries, some civil society organization, some sovereigns, some cities, some big philanthropic organization. It's a different way to do things. Uh, on uh, uh, competition, uh, cooperation, I'm, I'm with you that, uh, I mean, humans, and this is what uh, social sciences, uh, psychology, anthropology, ethnology tell you, humans are driven by two basic functions. Uh, one is uh, competition and one is cooperation. Uh, competition coming from uh, the necessity to arrange uh, sexual reproduction uh, in a way that males and females compete for the best breed, and this is 
been there for a long time and probably will remain there for a long time. And cooperation stemming from the fact that if you do a few things together, you better uh, preserve or promote your interest. And got lots of examples in nature, like uh, ants or some animals or monkeys or whatever, who know that cooperation works better than competition. Uh, so, and you know, we we have these two things. The reality being that. One of the fundamental features of market capitalism, not just as an economic system, but as a ideological frame, gives more weight to competition than to cooperation. My Ricardo Schumpeterian simple model is not basically a model of cooperation. It's a model of competition. It's a model where the benefits of competition are what feeds economic growth and the creation of efficiencies more than cooperation. And this is certainly something that, at least in my view, at least for, for critics of global market capitalism as, as, a, as a ideology, as a system that you believe is the right one to manage human societies, this is an imbalance which will probably need to be addressed and the necessity to confront more efficiently environmental problems leads us to a situation where cooperation works better than competition. In traditional global market capitalism, it's true that competition has in many ways worked more than cooperation. And, uh, Having to cope with the huge environmental problem we have is the other way around. And this necessitates a sort of shift, which of course is not an easy one. Huh? Because cooperation entails a sort of common view of what we want to do together. Competition is relatively simple. Huh? If you are more, more efficient in finding the right uh, female or in lo locating your chip factory at the right place, you win. Huh? Uh, there are many more winners than losers, huh? true, but it still is geared by the notion that you win. If it's about environment, it's much more difficult, or it's about, or it's about uh, connecting different data regimes, you need to share a sort of common sense of what's good and what's bad. And competition saves you from the effort of, of deciding what's good and what's bad. Whereas cooperation leads you very often to have to agree on what's good and what's bad. And it's a much more uh, complex way to go. Uh, but I think, I think, including in in, in organizing uh, sort of the infrastructures of globalization, we will have in the future to inject a higher dose of, uh, of uh, cooperation. On, uh, on the WTO, I mean, yes, for the moment, uh, US have uh, vetoed uh, the nomination of new judges in the uh, court of WTO. And because there's been a prevailing interpretation that uh, judges in WTO uh, need to be nominated uh, according to consensus, which I must say I believe is a perfectly disputable uh, interpretation of the WTO statute, but let's leave that complex question aside. Uh, I mean, the reality of what's happening in WTO is, is really simple. Huh? Whether the US are after destroying the system or whether they are after improving it, according to their own view of what needs to be improved for the US, and the answer to this question is absolutely unclear, huh? does does Mr. Trump want to get rid of WTO? 
because it's been a disaster for the US, which is what he has tweeted. Uh, I'm not kidding. I mean, he, the guy, tweets that the WTO has been a disaster for the US, which is a total disconnection with any sort of reality. It's never been a bad thing for the US, not least because the US have been co-piloting the system for such a long time. So the fact that this doesn't make sense doesn't change the fact that we don't know whether it's a tactical position, sort of read the art of the deal, which I think many of us should have done in due time to understand uh, what was to come uh, under specific uh, temperature and pressure circumstances. So whether it's a tactical thing to threaten to quit in order to make it work or whether it's a serious attempt to destroy WTO is unclear. But what's for sure, <laughs> I think, is that the rest of the world, for the moment, still believe that a multilateral approach to trade opening is better than a unilateral or even a purely bilateral approach. Not that you can do things only multilaterally or only bilaterally or only unilaterally or only regionally. The reality is that we've all had a preference for doing this multilaterally because that's the way it works best, and we have, I think, to remain of this view. Maybe he has a different view, but maybe he's pure wrong, which, by the way, again, believes, and, and if he was right, there would have been some sort of sign that he's right for the last three or four years. Huh? If, uh, you know, if, uh, if fishing trout with a hand grenade was the right way to go, we would know it. Everybody would be fishing trout with grenades and not with normal fishing lines, which is the way you catch fish. So it's, 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 it's a basic ideological problem, and I think we have to make sure that the, the view of the 75 <laughs> of the world economy who believe that multilateral is the way to go prevails over the view of 25% of the world economy. There's no reason why 25% of the world economy would dictate its position to 75% of the world economy, especially now that you've got China in, in, in the other side. Although, as we all know, there's, there's more noise than reality in this notion that uh, China is the new leader of trade opening on this planet, uh, which deserves uh, quite a lot of qualifications. Uh, uh, be serious, we have serious problems with the way China handles a number of uh, its trade relationship, including in subsidizing uh, a, a large part of SOEs, which, by the way, is also one of the paradoxical consequences of globalization. Uh, the, the reason why China had to regrow its state-owned sector from 15% of the Chinese economy before the crisis to 30% after the crisis is the crisis. And the crisis was not born in China, it was born in the US. And it's a default of regulation of the US financial system that has led China to re-become more communist than in the past. Which, you know, when you think of things this way, is really strange. But that's the reality. I mean, Xi Jinping only came after that. It's not Xi Jinping who decided that China should grow its state-owned sector by double between 08 and, and now. It's, it's the fact that they had to pump quite a large part of money into their economy to sustain the crisis, and that they did that which was, was available, which is this, their state-owned sector. But then, of course, coexisting with a China which has become so big and so important in international trade, with 30% of its economy under state command, is a much more complex problem than doing that. The way we did it in the origins of China joining the WTO, with the view that little by little their state-owned sector would shrink to sort of normal proportion, which is, by the way, what happened consistently 
uh, between uh, 01 and, uh, and, uh, and 08. And at the time, starting with, you know, at the time when Deng Xiaoping decided to open, China was 100% collectivist. And it moved to 15% in 08, and it re-moved to 30% now. So this, this, is, this is a reality, which means that we, I mean, if Trump is right on one thing, is that the WTO system today does not properly discipline a number of Chinese trade practices. This is true. But the reason why this mandated negotiation on reviewing the subsidies agreement in WTO never happened was that the US blocked the round in 08. The reason why we did not get to the point of addressing the part of the Doha mandate, the previous attempt to reform WTO, the reason why we did not get to the part of the agenda which was about changing and modernizing the subsidy agreement is because the US froze the round because of agricultural negotiations. So again, you know, there is a bit of a paradox in screaming that the system does not address properly some Chinese practices, which is true, but when you are the country who prevented this to happen. But of course, Trump probably has no clue that this is what happens, and anyhow, if it's about his predecessors, they did everything wrong, so including that, uh, probably. Uh, on, on populism, I mean, there is a wave of this kind in the Western world, not only in the Western world, you know, Philippines, uh, Brazil, uh, India, to some extent, uh, Turkey, uh, Russia, uh, are probably also can be qualified as being at least partially run by populists. And by the way, apart from US, in the Western world, this populist surge has not led, and we will see how Boris Johnson behaves uh, after the elections. But in most cases, in the Western world where the populist pulsions has been growing early, they've been limited, but with the election of Trump which of course is a major exception. Whereas in the Western world, <laughs> what happened in you know, Brazil elected Bolsonaro and Philippines elected Duterte and uh, Turkey elected Erdogan. Huh? So, so th there, is, there is a difference in proportion. My view for, for what it's worth is that we have this populist, nationalist, uh, protectionist, uh, xenophobic uh, uh, streams but that so far, it has not worked. Now, provided we stay in a reasonably democratic environment, if a government does something that does not work, people will change the government. This is, this is what democracy is about. The real danger does not come from the fact that populist movements are on the rise, because if they take the case of Italy, for instance, we have, we have an experience there. If they do things that do not work, democracy will fix it. The, the real problem is if you start attacking democracy itself, like we've had attempts of this kind, which are worrying in countries like Hungary, for instance, in Europe, within uh, the European Union uh, constitution, you know, we, you have to behave like a democracy. And you have to respect the independence of the judges and the press and the media and individual freedom and the whole thing. So the big danger is not populists getting more support in public opinion for some time. The big danger is if populists get a majority for some time, their economic and social will not be better 
but they can use this time to start biting into democratic basic institutions. I mean, we all know, for instance, that in the US, the big damage which Trump could do long term is uh, in, with, in nomination in the Supreme Court. Huh? Because if there's a majority in the Supreme Court that, uh, that is against abortion, then this will be a big change. And if there's a majority in Hungary that, or in Poland that is that the government should nominate judges, well, unless uh, having uh, the judicial system independent, this is a big way backwards. So, in a nutshell, the problem is not populist. The problem is if populists come to power, can they or should they or will they have a capacity to move the system backwards and then prevent the normal functioning of democracy, which is if the government doesn't do things right, you get rid of it. If chronism, if the, if the sort of interpenetration of media and power uh, go this way, then this is the real danger. And I think on this, I mean, we are not out of the woods. I mean, illiberalism is a threat in the contemporary world. I think that's a discussion we're also having here. So that was a very valid point. So uh, I, I'd like to just open a last round of questions. I think, Donnie, you had your hand. Uh, anybody else, uh, lady there? Oh, a lot. <laughs> OK, please. Okay, one, two, where was it? Three, I, uh, the lady there. And then th two there. Yeah. Andy? You, okay, you give to the younger people. <laughs> and then two in the back, okay? All right. Donnie, then you, and then the lady. Yeah. Thank you, Ibu Mari, and thank you, Mr. Lamu. Very insightful uh, talk. Can you speak loud, uh, louder? And yeah, yeah. Thank you, Ibu Mari, and thank you, uh, Mr. Lamu, for Remarks. I'm Doni Narioko from Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia. So our institute cares a lot about the regional integrations. So two quick questions. You were saying that we should pay attention all of, to all of these social sustainability measures, environmental sustainability measures. All these are investment, public investment. You know. Then how do we fund it? How, does, how do countries spend money on it, uh, given the outlook of, you know, a lot of countries are having uh, outlook of budget deficit because exports decline, so that revenue, tax revenue collection declines, and so on and so forth. So is there, do you have any idea on how, how countries deal with it? You know, we have to invest, but we don't really have money. Second is, general consensus say we cannot really insulate from what happened uh, between China and US. Now, from the perspective of regional integration, ASEAN and East Asia, ASEAN has its own regional objective agenda, you know, to, to grow, to be prosper together. Is your remark suggesting that, you know, all of this regional integration agenda should for the moment perhaps focus more on the distributional aspect, inclusivity, rather than targeting growth, for example. Uh, because, you know, anyway, the prospect is, is, is low. Would that be a sensible approach, at least for the next five or 10 years? Thank you. Thank you. Please uh, introduce yourself uh, and where you're from, and please keep your questions brief. Thank you, Bu Mari. My name is Rico from Jakarta, and I have one question for Mr. Paskami. I have one question. One simple question, actually. What your take on the movements like, you know, Ballonstone Park, and also one more movement is the Guillejon, the Yellow Jacket movement in France? Yeah, yellow, yeah, yellow fast, sorry. So I just wanna get more in depth, you know, perspective from you about those movements, since you mentioned gender equality and then social. Thank you. Hello, I'm Safina, researcher from Migrant Care. Uh, I did uh, work for SDGs and I just came back from New York last month uh, at the SDG Summit and I see 
which along its uh, UN gener UNGA and Trump said that we reject globalism and embrace the doctrine of patriotism. And what I see is, uh, yeah, well, Trump is saying that uh, so hard and what is our globalization status of, uh, of our, maybe in, in, in our context in Indonesia, what, or where is our status of globalization? And when Trump saying that, what's on my mind is he just not want to doom the globalization, but, but also our liberal democracy. Thank you. Okay, and I think there were two questions. One, one, two. Thank you very much for the opportunity and for the exquisite uh, discussion. My name is Muhammad Nidal and I am an international relations student from Jaiwa University. Well, since we have witnessed uh, the global uncertainties from Brexit, uh, US-China trade wars, uh, populism, and so on and so forth. And my question is, speaking of international politics, what do you think, what kind of polarity uh, are we living right now? Is it still US hegemon or even bipolar, tripolar, multipolar, or even nonpolar? And what do you think is uh, the ideal polarity we should live uh, in order to sustain uh, global, sust uh, go global sustainability. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Bumari. Uh, Mr. Pascal, my question is very simple. Oh, oh yeah, my name is Ben from Spirulina Hub. We found Spirulina or Spirulin in France. Um, my question is very simple, that globalization has led Indonesia to import one million barrel of oil per day. One million barrel of oil per day. That's what globalization has made Indonesia. So my statement is energy and food should be from lo local resources. What do you think of that statement? Thank you. As a board member of IFPRI, that's a good question for you. I, I could, can I add just one more? You know, can, if, given all that we've heard today, uh, what, can, we, can we go it? what was the word? I like the, the one uh, our millennial was saying. The US has checked out, but it can't really leave. So while they're checking out, can we continue the WTO minus the US? Can we continue G20 or climate change without the US temporarily while they're checking out? And you know, is that, is that a possible world? And where would the collective leadership come from to make that happen? Okay, on, on, on the first question, uh, your starting point with that, improving social sustainability and environmental sustainability imply uh, more public uh, expenditure. This is only partially true. There are areas of sustainable sustainability, of environmental sustainability which stem from pure regulation or pure taxation of uh, carbon, for instance. So it's not that everything has to stem from increasing the level of tax base, hence public uh, systems, hence capacity to address a number of social safety net or educational or training. That's, that's partly true. But there remains, uh, I mean, if, if you take, take one example, which is waste management. In many cases, the progress in waste selection, collection, and treatment came from pure regulatory measures. Huh? deciding that uh, whatever uh, content of uh, waste uh, should not have 
more than X or Y or Z of this and that. And then when this was done, business or people started screaming, no, no, no way we can get there, this is too much. And then you stick to your regulatory approach and clever people find ways because it's pricey to, to change. Clever people find science, innovation ways to deal with that that were not available before. And it works. So it's not, it, there is a, an innovation capacity of properly uh, uh, managed regulatory system. It's not just about more money, but it is true that it is also about more money. And if, if in a country like Indonesia, the you know, tax collection is uh, to the tune of 15% uh, of, of, of the economy, you have a very limited capacity to address this issue through uh, public systems. Uh, and it's then a whole question of how you can move your tax base from 15% to 30%. I'm not talking like doing it in France, <laughs> where it's 50%. <laughs> uh, and I'm not sure we are not a bit too high, uh, at least in the efficiency of this, uh, of this, uh, of this uh, collection and redistribution. I'm absolutely convinced that in the, in the times to come, 15% uh, is not enough. Huh? Now, some people would say you know, that's the right way to go. I'm, I'm not sure that, and I'm, I'm very careful about what I say, but I'm not sure that if, if I look at the collective preferences of Indonesian people, they would all agree that 15% is the right way to go. They probably would like to go 20 or 30, but the reality is that for reasons that have to do with structural constraints, it doesn't get there. But it's not that people don't want it. It's not like people would say, oh, no, 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 I want to remain free, and 15% is already a lot, and more than that would be terrible and would kill innovation and motivation. I don't think that that's, that's where you are uh, with 15%. So, I mean, I think you have, to, you have to move further. On ASEAN integration, uh, I think, <laughs> and I always, I'm always careful not to compare too much EU integration to other bits of uh, integration uh, in, this, uh, in this planet. But I think there's one question which is how much of economic integration can you reach without some sort of political integration? And this is an open question. Notably, if you look at what needs to be done in the future uh, for economic integration, which have much more to do with aligning collective preferences in regulatory systems, this is a complex thing, which probably will trigger political sensitivities which will need to be addressed through proper political processes. And then you have this whole problem of, of uh, the balance between uh, the competitive pressure of opening markets and integrating the economy and the structural capacity of part of your ASEAN countries or of your population to cope with that. And when, I mean, I don't want to sound too old, but when Delors decided EU should go to the internal market, i.e., uh, okay, uh, to remove borders, thus creating this big uh, competitive area, he simultaneously made sure that EU funding would go to less developed regions in order to help them coping with this competitive shock. Uh, so he, he handled both the Ricardian and the Schupenterian part of the equation of removing borders. And this is something which is probably still ahead of you, although you have different geometries for, uh, you know, Lao, PDA, or, or, <coughs> or Myanmar. Uh, I mean, the problem of coping with the differences, you'll have, you have to address at some stage. 
Uh, on yellow vase, uh, it's a very typical uh, French of uh, going down the street to uh, protest. We have a very long tradition of uh, people going down the streets when they're unhappy instead of behaving normally, i.e. Uh, making things happening in parliaments. Uh, and we have one more example uh, this week about uh, pension uh, reforms. Uh, I think if we leave aside uh, a sort of specific French protestation coefficient, let's say, and we have that, then you have the problem that, you know, politics are becoming more polarized, uh, th given a number of developments, including social, uh, spatial, educational uh, fragmentation, uh, plus social networks, and this entails new forms of political activism. Uh, now, whether this is transformational, or whether people will demonstrate in the streets from time to time, and this will not fundamentally change political systems, I think, uh, remains uh, open. Uh, I'm not sure that the multiplication of street protests will or not change political systems. It may or it may not. Uh, on, on US globalism, or I mean, you know, I, like you, I read carefully what uh, Trump said uh, at the uh, UN uh, lectern. Yeah, his view is that uh, globalism is a terrible thing and that uh, patriotism, nationalism, uh, my country first is the way to go. Uh, I beg to disagree. And true, this may have consequences on uh, liberal democracy, uh, which I think I mentioned and we should be, uh, we should be aware of. On polarity, uh, I think, uh, as I said, we have to live with this US-China rivalry whether this will be the polarity or whether other players like the EU, like ASEAN, like uh, India uh, can sort of build something uh, resilient in the middle, I'm not sure. At least this is what the EU will be trying to do. This is what, you know, when you listen to the new president of the EU commission talking about a geopolitical commission, this is the meaning as far as the European Union is concerned, you will see in the years to come more focus on international issues. Uh, so far, we've been very focused on integrating economically, politically. The last 10 years have shown that all the crises that hit the European Union came from abroad. It's like uh, imports for George Bush. No, they all come from abroad. Yeah. All the crises which have hit the EU came from abroad. No. Financial crisis came from the US. The refugee crisis came from the Middle East. Uh, they, were not, they were not generated within the European Union. And then the conclusion from this 10 years of experience, it would better be a bit better at spotting possible threats <laughs> before we are hit by them with the sort of huge consequences this had uh, on. So I think that there's a natural lesson of experience that will, the problem is that how do you transform uh, uh, an economic thing like EU, which only has real cloud in international trade, and I know that, you know, when you are the trade commissioner, you're the Minister of Trade for Europe, and you, your weight is the weight of the European market. It's very different in other areas. Uh, so this will depend on a number of developments of, of this kind. On, on uh, globalization making Indonesia import a million tons of uh, fossil fuels a day, uh, I mean, it's not globalization. Uh, it's it's market capitalism. Uh, at the moment, uh, you have uh, fossil fuels. Uh, you have more than what you need, you export it. And if you have less than what you need, you import it. I mean, fossil fuel is a fatal trade. It's not a normal trade. 
fossil fuel doesn't come from comparative advantage. It comes from natural endowment. And usually, if you have it, you have too much. And if you don't have it, you have too little. And you just trade. Now, the big, the big difference in the times to come is that energy system will have to move renewable. And this will fundamentally change geopolitics of, uh, of the planet, including, by the way, in many areas. I participated in a very interesting report, which was published by IRENA, uh, the International Renewable Energy Agency, at the beginning of this year. Remember that, Mary? And, uh, and there's quite a bit of interesting developments on it. Finally, uh, because I understand I have to go, uh, can we have a WTO without US? Uh, I don't think we should. But nor do I believe that in the name of caving in to US pressures I disagree with, we should keep them in. The, the, the obvious strategy is keep the US within the tent and bring China into more into the tent. This is the EU strategy. This is, I think, what EU, ASEAN, Brazil, Africa, India, let's leave India aside because on trade issues, they're always a bit weird. And the notion that you have a stable coalition with India on anything is a bit, uh, a bit adventurous, but there is a way to stabilize the system provided, provided we tell the US that if they have a problem, we can discuss it, we can negotiate it, but that taking hostage is not the way to go. And, and I think th there is a red line there. So I don't think we should have a WTO without the US, but I think if they really keep behaving the way they do, we have to find an alternative and the alternative is a 75% economy which still believes in a multilateral <coughs> rules-based trading system because this is the best way to go, not because he's right or wrong. I, again, let's leave this, let's look at things how they work. Unilateralism, nationalism, uh, uh, protectionism is not the way to go simply because it does not work. Thank you. Thank you, Pascal. A round of applause for our speaker. In the interest of time, I'm not going to summarize, but I think uh, let's rest assured that globalization is not doomed yet. <laughs> but we do have our homework cut out for us in terms of what we need to do as well as I think go beyond the government to government, the poly governance. I think this is something we also have in Indonesia. You need the wider stakeholders to be part uh, of the conversation and the advocacy. So thank you very much, Pascal. And I think we have come to the end of our program. Uh, I'll give it back to the MC. <laughs> Thank you very much for the insightful discussion, Mr. Rami and Professor Pangestu. Please remain on the stage. I'm sorry, Mr. Please remain on the stage because now we will have the photo session and token of appreciation. Audience, let's give another big round of applause for our speakers. <laughs> now, Professor Jisman Simanjuntak, our chairman of CSIS Foundation, will give token of appreciation, of appreciation for Mr. Rami and have a photo session together afterwards.